right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Heartscape Growth Show. My name is Alex from Techo Block, and today we're joined by ET from Leger Landscapes. They are one of the largest paver restoration companies in North America. They're from Montreal, Quebec, in Canada, one of the most mature hardscape markets in North America. And uh, we're going to talk today about hiring and retaining talent. Um, you've done a really good job building your company. You've been in the industry for two decades now. Uh, this part of your business, the focus on restoration, has been for about a decade. But tell me a little bit about your business. You're up to four crews now, uh, repairing projects, redoing sand jobs, cleaning, sealing, all that stuff. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you guys do. Well, thanks, Alex, for having me on here. And uh, we started off, I've been to every, I've been to 10 Techo shows now. This is my 10th. <laughs> wow. So Thank you. always follow Techo, really, really big fan of the products. We started off doing more um, maintenance of like lawn mowing, hedge trimming, the typical landscaping. Mm -hmm. We got into to interlock, got into retaining walls. We started getting more and more requests for people that were calling asking about weeds growing through the stones. And they wanted to take their whipper snippers and just cut out the weeds. And you end up ch changing so many heads on your trimmers, you're like, <laughs> This is ridiculous. This is not a, 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 long, a, a long right term, way, a long term yeah. solution, exactly. So we kind of got into the whole polymeric sand seam of things and started looking at ways that we could repair jobs and we started liking it. It was easier. There was less and less need for equipment, less and less for less overhead needed, less, less deliveries. And so in the last 10 years, we started shifting away from your traditional uh, maintenance installation to what we would call more paver restoration. Okay. So uh, you've been doing this for <clears throat> since 2010, I think you were saying. The uh, business, when you started, I mean, obviously it's a very interesting entry level kind of business in the industry. You don't need a lot of people, you don't need a lot of equipment, you don't need to invest a lot of money to get started. Uh, what did your business look like in the early days and how did you get to where you are today? The early part of it was a lot of, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of um, you know, trying to juggle all those different aspects of, you know, the design build versus your maintenance, which are, you know, weekly contracts, and then trying to squeeze in doing some repair work. And so we eventually decided, look, let's just try to just eliminate services. Every year we'd have a checklist and we'd eliminate different services and we'd get down to just the most profitable and the ones that were the easiest to manage, easiest to train, and just the most, uh, the most fun to do as well. So over the history of the company, you were offering a ton of different services. You were trimming hedges, cutting lawns, repairing paver jobs, doing paver jobs, doing sand and everything. But you, I, mean, I don't know how many of you are doing this right now in your business, but I find this really interesting. You have a list of all the things you do, and every year you take some things off the list because they are not the top priority for your business. They're not the most profitable, they're not the most fun. At what point did that make sense for you to start doing? Like when did you start? I don't, I don't feel like that's like a natural thing to do. No, a lot of it, people want to offer more to be able to do more to make more. You know, it, it, it turned a few things. First of all, it did come to a, a labor shortage. We realized that the time it took to train employees to do certain things, and if I want to set up my truck a certain way to do maintenance and then have to like reload and load or get a new truck for another, for another type of design build or restoration, it was becoming too time consuming and space was an issue. And so, those aren't billable hours, so your overhead exactly. starts going up. So we were having too much overhead, too much equipment, and it was hard to train people to do the job properly. So we thought, hey, why don't we try just making it really simple? Okay. So just starting to do a lot of the lift and relays, pressure washing, changing out the, the polymer sand. That was, quickly became something that our guys enjoyed doing. If you ask a guy, would you rather sweep sand or build a retaining wall? Hands in the room, who would rather build a wall or sweep sand, right? We'd rather sweep sand, right? It makes no sense. I mean, it's, it's definitely the least labor intensive. Yeah. So you went from, uh, I guess, just a handful of employees at the start, now up to four crews. We said we we're gonna talk about hiring practices. What are some of the things that you've learned over your career that make the greatest impact in hiring good qualified people that stick around? You know, Alex, I like to tell people, I'm in the people industry and I also do landscaping. It's dealing with people. It's being personable, taking the time to individually um, focus on each employee. I mean, in a small company of 10 people or less, you can do that, you can have that time. And to try to get them to find a way for them to reach their personal goals and have, a, and, and have an open dialogue with them. And for us, it was by being an attractive company to work for. So just as we market for 
you know, our job to present ourselves with logos and, and, and brochures and pamphlets and websites. I said, I have to do the same thing for my employees. I have to make it look like a fun place to work with. I have to introduce really aspects of culture into our company. And I consider myself the, the chief culture engineer. The, the oh, sorry, CEO. <laughs> Yes, right. CCO. That's right, yeah. yeah. So culture is the most important thing. And we use social media a lot to breed that. Yes, we talk about our jobs. Yes, we try to promote uh, different promotions, things like that. But really, we use social media specifically for promoting our culture, promoting our core values, promoting um, hiring and, and retention of employees that way. So I find this particularly interesting because it's February 3rd, 2022 today. Pretty much everyone here in the room has got more calls coming in than projects that they can take on in the year. On a lot of other episodes of the show, we've talked about marketing your business to create more demand for your business so that you can be selective with the work that you take on. You've had so much work over the years and there are not a lot of companies in the niche that you've identified and that you've really gone after that you're leveraging the power of social media and your marketing ability to really get your name out there in front of potential employees instead of potential customers. Now, you are doing it for potential customers too, but you're using it for both audiences and that's one of the ways that you're attracting people. Exactly, I like to actually look at you know, fellow contractors' websites and I look at their core values and I look at their, at their hiring page and I ask myself the, like, the objective question, if I was a, a young guy out of high school Think considering going down the college route, university route, why would I want to be a landscaper? Okay. Why would I want to go down that road? And for us, it was really simple. It was, well, I want to be an attractive employer. I want, to, want people that want to come to work and really see it as being like a family. And just to kind of back to the whole social media thing, we put a post up in the month of January, end of January, just listing our core values on our website. Yeah, I saw it. And we just put it out there. You know, we have passion, continuous growth, integrity, can-do attitude, excellence, and exceeding expectations. Well, let's, let's slow that down. So, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so passion. How, how many core values are six, there? Six. Six core values. Okay, so what are they? Passion, uh -huh. continuous growth, okay. exceeding expectations, and um, can integrity as well. And the one more is excellence. I guess I'm forgetting them, but we have a, written down. Don't be nervous. The reason that we, well, because there's six of them, and also the fact that we want our employees to remember them, we talk about them every day in our in our team huddle. We ask How one of the guys that? to go through that to say, hey, in the morning we're gonna. Be, I'll give like a basic introduction. Say, hey, today we're going this job site with this team to kind of break it down. And then one employee will go. We we have this in a, a schedule. Will go over a core value or one of our, our list of 10 things that require no talent, like being on time, good attitude, positive uh, smile, all these things. That you Examples see. of how they're living those values yeah. in and their workday? Yes, and they can either themselves mention a story that how they demonstrated it, but usually what we encourage is how some other employee in the company demonstrated that value. Uh -huh. And then we just kind of reinforce that. It's really every day we have a different person sharing a different core value. Is it, so like, I'm gonna just play devil's advocate here. Like, I've worked in other companies where like the day starts with like a, a cheer or something like that and it feels kind of like, it feels fake. Like people are just going through the motions. Did, did you find that to be an obstacle as you were starting to do this? Like new people, they're like, what the heck is this? Like, what are we doing here? Can we just go to work? I would say you have to get buy-in from your management, from like your crew leaders, uh, from your project managers, and whoever is there of a position of leadership, if they're, if it's real, if it's not just a facade, if your core values are not just something you put on the wall and forget about, if it's part of your everyday experience, I definitely see there being massive potential for that. And people, and the buy-in was there with their employees. And they, obviously you have some tire kickers, but most of the guys, they saw the value in it. Because we all, we'd highlight birthdays, highlight, you know, uh, one guy graduated from school, we all you bought him a cake, celebrated. Just <laughs> small things that make a difference. Mm -hmm. So outside of leveraging social media by posting things like the values and how fun it is to do the work that you do and the crew environment that you've built, are there other things that you do that make the hiring process easier for your company? Well, we actually make the hiring process as hard as possible um, to contradict that. We're, trying, we're not okay. trying to attract anyone. Like, so whenever someone applies on our, on our Facebook or through an ad, we're gonna ask them to jump through a few hoops. We're gonna ask them to send us an email 
for example, with a specific line, with a term, like for example, hire me now, or uh, join the Rockstar team as the email header. If you don't put that email as the email header, especially if you're applying for a leadership role, we're not even gonna look at your application. Because you're not following the you basic can't follow instructions. instructions. Okay. So that's, that's right away, knockoff question over there. That we might ask you, hey, thank you for doing that, could you text me at this number? And if they can't do that, if they call, or if they email again, or if they can't follow that instruction, we're gonna have probably not even consider them, especially in a leadership role. Now this gets can backfire you in a little bit because especially with the uh, labor shortage, you're taking a risk. But mm. we found really good candidates that way. We found our office manager that way. We found uh, a couple of our lead techs that way from people that were able to follow those instructions and go through that, um, go that process and eventually made it to our team. Well, I think you're getting both more serious people and more qualified people by doing that. Exactly. It's way too easy to apply on Facebook or on Indeed these days. You can like bulk apply yeah. to multiple jobs, and it, it takes the personality away. And we're always going to ask people when they apply. We'll give them a, once we, they've gone through those preliminary steps. Mm -hmm. We'll call them really fast. And say, hey, how'd you hear about our company? Why do you want to work for us? And if they have no idea who we are, what we are, we're like, hey, are you sure you want to apply for us? Because you don't even know really what we do. Simple think I cut grass because the name word landscapes is in yeah. my in my name. It's like no, we actually don't even have a lawnmower in the company. And so if you haven't actually researched that much about who you're working for, are you really someone that I want to have on my team, taking care of my clients? Hmm. You want to twist that mic up a little bit. Um, what about the interview process? So let's say we've gone through the screening or that pre-screening of send me an email with this subject line, shoot me a text with this, and then you ask that, that question, how did you hear about us, why do you want to work for us? Like, what does that interview process look like? Do they start talking with you? Do they start talking with an office admin? Or? Yeah, I'll have my office manager go through, like we call it the speed dating. We're okay. basically five minute conversation, give me the, the roughs of, of who you are, what you're about. And if that goes well, then we'll schedule a, a Zoom interview with me. I got tired of meeting people at coffee shops <laughs> and, and having them stand me up, so it's a Zoom call. So okay. we're gonna have a Zoom call, I send them an email how to set up the Zoom. And you also wanna know if they're gonna use technology. So the pandemic has helped us in that that everyone and their grandma knows how to use Zoom. So we have a Zoom interview. I will go through a, a list of qualifying questions. Uh, some of them have point values attributed to them based on uh, how they answer a certain question. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for certain characteristics depending on the role they're applying for. So this is for any role? Uh, like no, this more is the for, process for like entry level to office admin to a leadership role yeah, in the company? Yeah, for, for a leadership role in the company, we might be more specific on leadership questions. Yeah. But also we'll want to make sure that they are versed in the industry. So. For a, for a basic you know, laborer role, we call them assistant technicians role, that's, that's our first level in our company. Um, we're all, we're gonna just introduce them to, like, ask more labor related questions, because we're most of my, actually, correction, every single one of my employees have come through in the last uh, two years, three years actually, did not have any landscape, prior landscape experience, landscape construction experience. None. None. So I went from learning how to start a paver saw, learning how to you know, tie work boots on properly, uh, to basically, some guys have become project managers in, the, in those last couple of years. So, okay, I have two questions based on the things you just said. The first one is, um, what's the hierarchy of positions in your company? Because you just said like the entry level position is called assistant technician. It's not laborer, it's not grunt, it's not FNG, we know what that stands for, right? The FN new guy? Yeah? The gopher? That too. <laughs> so uh, we start them off as assistant techs. Okay. And what I brought in this year is I, I hired a graphic artist to make me like a visual description of like a staircase. And on that staircase, you kind of see the different levels that an employee can go from assistant tech all the way up to senior project manager. So you have deliverables on based on each role. So assistant tech has three or four things that they have to accomplish. You know, have an 80 percent or more um, on, their, on their last evaluation. Um, aspire to our core values, uh, show up on time. That might be real basic, because our goal is to get someone in the door, we see has potential, then we can move them up to lead tech one. Uh, sorry, uh, so lead tech one, then it'll be lead tech two, junior project manager, project manager, and senior project manager. And because we're in the restoration business, it's not as difficult as some of like, you know, uh, to train a full, to f train someone to read plans or to really do a, to be a fully seasoned veteran. So I'm hoping that by the first year, I can get someone almost into that project manager role. Uh, for definitely, he can. So be you can climb the ladder quickly, is what you're saying. The goal is yeah. So we're going to start him off at more of an attract at a above average uh, industry rate, yeah. and then we're going to try to get him a few wins. 
so a dollar to raise the top, okay. and then a, a significant raise once they get to the to the so, higher position. So what are the, how okay? What do those look like? Hour, hourly rates? Well, I mean, if you're comfortable talking about the rates, let's talk about the rates. But I'm thinking, like, what are the little wins that get you that little extra bump, that dollar, that two, that make them feel that they're making progress quickly? Like, hey, this is a place I should stick around because they really seem to value me here, and I seem to be progressing really well. Yeah, so we've had that, the situation with uh, employees that are actually, you know, qual um, they've been around for five, six years, yeah. or, or, or let's say four years. And they're not ready to move up in the company. But you have this young guy that starts out, and he's got a lot of potential, and he like moves past skill-wise mm -hmm. that four-year-old guy. So the four-year-old, the guy who's been here for four years says, well, I've been here four years, so I should be the project manager. I got sonority. But the two-year-old guy has more skill. So what do you do? How do you, how do you explain to that guy without making him feel bad and quitting on you yeah. that he actually has, that he's not the right fit? So we have, in each of these roles, um, we have a, like a, a certification, like a, like a checklist. Okay. And if, if you're able to accomplish those tasks, that means you're, you're able to move up. And if you're not, if you, if you can't, and the, and the bottom the first few steps in our, in our hiring process, I mean, in our moving up process, are more task oriented. You know, properly loading a trailer, properly compacting, grading, all these different aspects of landscaping. But when you move towards the leadership side, it's more leadership techniques. You know, can lead a team, can diffuse a situation, can talk to a client, can do a light sales uh, pivot. How do you um, measure those things, though? It, we're still developing it. We're basically yeah. uh, jumping out of a plane and building us on the way down, building a <laughs> on the way down. So, so part of it is, you know, we're in that place where we're trying to, 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 to base that based on performance from other employees in the past. And based on our, you know, we're at, we're at four teams, so you can't, you know, that we're not going to have, as of now, ten teams in the, in the industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, in our specific uh, trade uh, right now, but we try to measure it based on, you know, based on the, on the performance and just based on the, on the reviews. We have, we try to bring in um, reviews every two to three weeks. Try to at least give them some feedback. So employee some, reviews. They just sit, sit down with you, or they sit down with their direct supervisor. They'll sit down with the direct supervisor. Sit down with me, and then they're going to have their guys underneath them to have reviews. Now, whenever you have a new guy on the job, it's you don't want to. You can't necessarily take as much time, or you probably should take more time with them in that sense. But I think the more that people at least have a an, an, a place and a time that they can speak and they can be heard, and their uh -huh. suggestions are valued. So I might not necessarily agree with the suggestion that the new guy brings in. If he's trying to teach me how to shovel gravel, maybe. He doesn't have the best technique, but at least to acknowledge that I've heard him and say, "Hey, I'll consider that." But our company way is doing this for now. But like, we're gonna put that. You know, we're gonna we're, we're, we we hear you, but at the same time, we have a you know. So it gives you like a, a good two-way communication early on with the, with the employee, and you maintain it by having it scheduled on a regular, yeah, pace. And, and I'm not sitting here today saying that I have everything figured out. There's, there's times oh. that you know, the crunch goes there and you kind of miss it for a month. But the goal is to try to have those reminders already in the calendar. Always have those, those um, we call them GSRs, goal set and reviews, on, on a regular basis. And if you have that on a regular basis, it becomes part of their, part of their, their role as an employee. Um, and then setting those specific goals, I think that is what people want. And just kind of backtrack to like your first day in the job. You know, If you're the first day in the job and you show up at a company, if you're like me, I'm a, I'm the type of the guy to want to go get, and I want to grow in the company. Yeah. So how can I grow? Tell me how what you want from me. Yeah. yeah. So if I have the if I if I see the spreadsheet of like how I can get to that you know project manager role, and I see that if I do this this and this, I will get there. That's going to motivate me, and that'll you'll right away you'll see the leaders emerge and want that. A guy who's happy in in his labor role, he won't desire that. And that's fine. Absolutely. Not I, everyone needs to climb the ladder. Absolutely. But. And that's one of our hiring questions, too. Yeah. We say, are you, do you want to move up? Or are you just here for the summer? Like, how long are you on our, how long are we a part of your journey? And I, I, I encourage the guy. I said, listen, I don't, I'm not expecting you. I said, 95% of the guys that are going to work for me are not going to be landscapers for, for the rest of their life. And I totally respect that. But if you're going to be part of our journey, how can we help you reach your financial goals, reach your leadership goals, and reach, your, you know, reach the potential that you want to get in this company? Is there a bad answer to that question? The how long are we part of your journey? Well, some guys said, look, uh, I'm here for the summer. And I said, OK, well, if you tell me you're here for the summer, but you want me to train you to be a project manager, it ain't going to happen. No. I'm so I'm just trying to figure out yeah. how long they're going to be a part of us and how much am I going to invest in this employee. I had one guy, he was leaving the next day. He's like, I really want to learn how to cut with a saw. It was his last day on the job. I said, listen, man, like, I'll show you really quick, but it's not free you're school. leaving tomorrow. Yeah. You know? yeah.
Okay, I want to come back to the other question I had because you said almost, I don't know if you said all or almost all of the people you've hired over the past few years have no experience. So that places a great emphasis on training and training programs. What do you do or what do you have in place that helps someone come in off the street having never started a saw, never fired up a plate compactor, they don't know how to activate polymeric sand, they don't even know how to sweep it properly. They're, they're as green as can be in that assistant technician role. How do you help them be valuable to you and not be a pain in the you know what? Yeah, so if I can hire them fast enough early on this spring, I'll bring them to a showcase like this. We have, you know, Montreal, you guys have a summit as well that we, mm -hmm. I bring my guys. And I say, look, come to this summit, learn about the equipment, you know, have free food. Everyone loves food. Food is the greatest motivator um, for any employee. And you just tell them there's free food. There's a potential to, to you know, get free, free swag and learn about, you know, try out these different equipments and learn about this. So that's been something that a lot of employees really appreciate. Or sometimes the, the reps have like a, a day where they do demos. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's a great way as well. We've been using uh, elements like your Hardscaper course yeah. uh, online. You know, getting the guys, com, yeah. anyone that's attaining to a more of a leadership role has to go through those modules of retaining walls and uh, paper installation. And uh, YouTube's a great resource as well. And we have you know, about 100 videos bookmarked in YouTube that we make our employees go through. And we've uploaded a lot of these video trainings to Facebook, to a special Facebook training module group. It's called a social learning group. And we, we, it's almost like a, a progression. Like if you watch the video and hit I'm done, it'll, it'll show you like a progression bar of how far so you've you So you basically made your own private group it. for your people yeah. that you, you add them to. And then in there is all the content for the, tr that's freaking smart. Yeah, so I built it myself because a lot of the, there's a lot of these softwares out there, but um, you know, like Trainual or Greenius, these are different ones. Yeah, that are, but you gotta are, pay for those, they're and expensive. Facebook's free. Yeah, and so this, this took a bit of time, and I'm still working through it, but every year I add a few extra videos. So anyone coming in that uh, is new has to go through this training. It's a paid training. It takes about four hours to go through. Yeah. Um, this is before they even put their boots on the job site. So I hire How them. Long? And before they even come, to, I want them to know a bit about our company, what we're about, our core values. Um, I want them to know what polymeric sand is. I want them to know that they're not supposed to do certain things. Before they ever set foot on the job, how, how much time passes? Yeah, so it takes about three hours, two to four hours to do the, this online course, and it's a criteria. And I can tell if they've done it or not. So right away, if you're hired, but yeah. you, <coughs> you can't fill out that form, I mean, if you can't do it online, right away, I'll, I'll pay you for it, but you're not going to step foot on our job until you've actually accomplished that, that training. And that was, and that's before they even showed up for anything. So. Okay, I'm curious. Like you said, you bring them to showcase when when they start early enough in the year. Like if you hired them last week, you'd bring them here, get them to check out hardscaper.com, the YouTube videos, all that. But bringing people to events like this, there's a cost to that, no? Yeah, like you're paying their time when they're here. Absolutely. And you're prepared to do that a day of non-productive whatever. You're paying them just to come here, hang out, and hopefully learn enough and get inspired enough that they'll stick around. Is that the, the well, thought yeah, process? Or you're, like, you're, we're, in the we're in the marketing industry, but like I said before, we're marketing for employees. So if the first day of work mm -hmm. and the employee showed up like ready to prove himself and you're like, no, we're gonna go to a cool techo convention, you're gonna like sit around all day, have free food, hang out with the guys and learn about this and we're gonna you know, have breakfast and lunch provided and they're gonna get a free backpack. It sounds, for a young guy, that sounds like... An awesome first why, day. Why not? First day. It's, it's a great first impression. And I think it's a really cool way to develop and to bring in guys in the industry that... And I've seen a lot of companies here today with like, you know, five, six guys. Yeah. That's great. Like, hats, hats, off, hats off to you guys. That's a really good, a good retention technique. It's, it's bonding. Well, it's, it shows people like it's more than just, you know, slinging dirt with a shovel on a yeah. job site. Like, this is a massive industry with a ton of potential and you can have a, a future. You can have a career. In this, this isn't just a summer job that turns into two, three summers, and then eventually you blow out your back and you leave. Like it, it, it doesn't have to be that, and that's what we're trying to show people. And you're showing them just when you hire them. Yeah, and, really cool. and by showing them that chart, like the I call it the path at the top. Yeah. If they see that, they can see that eventually they can make thirty, thirty-five dollars an hour, and you know, on top of then there's overtime and all that, and be other benefits, group benefits that we have, and you know a whole bunch of other stuff that we introduce. That these are, are things that'll help people think of it as a career more than just a job. Yeah. And if I could just add to one early thing that we have early on, when the first day someone comes onto our job, after they've looked at the Facebook training, they've showed up, we give them a bag and they get all their tools, they get knee pads, you know, knee pads, chalk, tape measure, the whole thing. They sign off on it, they receive their gift. 
and this is like, they're right away, they're ready to go. There's yeah. not like, oh, I'm gonna steal the tape from John and then the, the, ta the, the chalk from Chuck, you know? No, yeah. they, he has all their own tool that's labeled, it's their own name. They get their company shirts the first day. We want the first day to be like, like a first date. We want it to be like, everything go well. <laughs> and like, we're obviously like, we're, we're building a relationship with these guys. I, if I could just uh, digress for a second, we give our guys one of those water jugs for yep. the first day. First day, here's your water jug. Here's a big Costco muffin. Here's a Gatorade. You know, and that's every day you, you get a Costco muffin, like those big guys there, and, uh, and a big uh, Gatorade. And we give that to the guys every single day. I buy by, I buy by the pallet at Costco. And it's a, it's, a, it's a really cool way, I think, to retain and just teach people that, you know, you're important to us and your, your contribution to our team is not unnoticed. And I'm a big, a very big fan of like supporting people, you know, by using food, everyone, everyone loves food, right? Mm -hmm. So on a hot day, especially, you know, break out the uh, ice caps if you're in Montreal, you know what that is. Uh, yeah. It's like frozen coffee. That's yeah. kind of what it is. Like that's, <laughs> I find that's a really cool way to retain it. We actually, last year, everyone was saying there's no, there's not enough good employees. I actually had to fire employees last year because I overhired in the spring thinking that um, maybe some guys didn't work out and as it was, some guys didn't work out, but I was not short employees last year hmm. because I think we kind of developed that culture. We have a retention program from within where if employees bring me another employee for an interview, I give them 25 bucks. If that employee stays for a month, they get 100 bucks. If they stay for three months, I'll give them 300 bucks. That's something we're implementing this year, the extra 300 bucks. I want the guys to stay the whole year. But that's kind of cool. You know, so if, I can get up to $425 in the first three months if I just, just bring, buy, bring, bring your friend. But the, the thing is, and I've had a lot of guys tell me, you know what, I don't have any actual friends that I would want working for me, uh -huh. you know, my, with me, because they're lazy or they're not good. And so they're, they actually kind of get they're kind of pre protective. They're pre-qualifying for you. They yeah. pre-qualify, and they get protective. They said, we want people that are gonna pull their weight. Mm. I don't want to bring in my friend that's lazy. Eventually, it's gonna hurt me. I'm gonna work harder, it's gonna hurt our friendship. Yeah. So, so the guys that have brought on other employee, other peers, usually mm. they've been good hires. That's super cool. Yeah. Uh, you have anything else you want to add on this topic of, of hiring and retaining people? I would just say, look at it like as much as we invest in marketing for jobs, and I think that with COVID, people are spending more money at home. We've had to market maybe a little less. People, jobs have been easier. Jobs are like almost flooding into our laps and we have to reject more. Mm -hmm. Just think of it the same way when it comes to hiring employees and developing talent from within. And, and if we're invested through, through different means, through either it means you know, more attractive uh, employment packages, unique um, bonuses, unique things that people can that make you different from everyone else, the same way that you want to be the different landscaper than all the other guys out there, how are you being a different employer? And I think that is the, the key to, to developing a strong team and a strong culture from within as well. Differentiate as an employer, Absolutely. just like you would as a designer or a builder. Yeah, what, what makes you different? Cool. Yeah. All right, well, let's open up to uh, questions from you guys. Anybody have any questions about hiring, retaining, training? We know it's the, it's the biggest pain point we have, so. Anybody have a crappy story they want to share? Yeah? Well, let's talk, I mean, it's, not, it's for you guys. Don't be shy. I guess this, this is really to help you guys. There. Okay, I'm gonna walk over there so I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, all right, wow, from Missouri. Okay, that's a great question. So the question is, you see me, here I am. The question is, running a small family business, what should the interview process look like if you're interviewing other family members, close friends, relatives, what does that look like in your opinion? I think it would come down to your employee agreement. Um, base, you got to find a way to remove emotion from the hiring experience because if, you know, your, your Uncle Fred's applying for the job and, well, he's always been a really cool uncle, he might be a really bad employee and he might be really negative and we hire and fire based on these core values that we have outlined here. We hire and fire based on, uh, we have employee agreements that are like 19 pages long 
Um, not because I want to be wordy, but at the same time, it gives you a lot more leverage. And whenever you have those employee assessments, you always refer back to two things, the core values. Are they fulfilling the core value? Are, you, are they fulfilling, are they, are they living with integrity? Are, are they exceeding expectations? Are they growing? Are they abiding by this? And so it's not, I don't like Uncle Fred, so I have to fire Uncle Fred. It's Uncle Fred doesn't match our core values. Uncle Fred doesn't match our employee agreement. That's company-wide, including myself. We hold ourselves accountable to this, and if we're gonna, everyone is accountable to this, mm -hmm. it's not about you and them anymore, it's about this specific um, You're document. making it more objective. It's not Absolutely. about the relationship, and, and just, you know, like, TechoBlock's a family business too, so uh, having been with the company for 17 years, company's been in existence for 32, or th this is the 30, yeah, 32nd year. So there's a lot of family in the company as well, and it has to be based on merit. It has to be based on the value that they bring to the organization, and it can't be about the relationships. But I think the way that, that you're putting it, is, it makes it really clear and objective. Like, these are the things that matter the most to the company, not to me as the owner, or as the manager, this is what matters to the company and everything we do is for the best of the company. So by making it an independent thing, it makes it easier to have those difficult conversations at times. Whether they're family, whether they're friends, whether they're cousins or, or, or they've just been employees who have been there since the beginning. You have to make it as objective as possible because otherwise it undermines the credibility with other employees. And then you can get great people in and they think they don't have a chance because they're not related. So they can't climb that, that ladder like you're talking about. Does that help? Yeah? And definitely yeah. I could point out that there's been times in terms of my company core values that I have not um, exhibited that as the owner. And I have, you know, it's humble, but it's good to eat humble pie to, sometimes. You need, yeah, you need it's to admit it. I messed it. up. Look, yeah. I didn't exhibit this value and that was wrong. And right away you get way more respect from the employees of being honest and by mm -hmm. saying, look, I'm a flawed individual but I'm, I'm gonna admit where I'm wrong and this is what I'm gonna do to change it. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think you get more respect from, from yeah. your team. If, if, you, if they see that you're also accountable, this isn't just something you put on the wall and yeah. use an excuse to fire someone. Yeah, no, you, you need to live by the values yourself and you need, to be, uh, you need to welcome those opportunities for feedback too. Nobody's perfect, everyone messes up. That you're the boss or not, you're gonna mess up. So if you can own those mistakes and open the opportunity to have that open dialogue with, with people on your team, then chances are they'll stick around and you grow something together. And, and if an employee does leave, we are a firm believer in exit interviews. Okay. So we have a conversation, we say, look, you're not coming back to our company, or let's say you're, we, you might not come back, someone goes to school, say, listen, I just want an open conversation with you, and hopefully we've had that dialogue throughout the whole time they're with us, they know trust. they yeah. can come to us. And I've gotten some really good advice from guys that say, you know what, you're, you're saying this one thing I don't like, or you're, you're, you act this way, you, you drop from the job site, and you're too abrupt for something. And it's helped me change as a leader, because uh, you know, we're all in leadership. Every single one of us might not consider yourself a leader, but leader, leadership, as John Maxwell says, is, is influence. Mm -hmm. It's having influence, and we all influence someone, so let's make sure that Either we can... Either positively or negatively. Absolutely. You choose how you do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Where's he from? I'm from Montreal, Quebec. So, yeah, what do you do about uh, retaining people in the off season? How do you pay them? Is it hourly? Is it salaried? What techniques do you use to be able to keep people so that you don't lose people so the snow falls? Yeah. So it's, I think it's having that honest conversation as soon as they're going to come on board, saying our, no, our season in Montreal goes from April 15th to November 15th. So down here, you guys have a longer season, right? We're, we're seven months. So it's right off the bat. It's seven, eight month season maximum. We're not, we're not any longer, so you have a limited, we have, we have a smaller window. We'll take, let's say, um, <clears throat> this new guy starts out $18 an hour, let's just say $18 an hour, that's gonna be our lowest, um, this year gonna be our lowest, $18 an hour for, for someone coming in with no experience. Right away, we're gonna like, if, based, if they come in the beginning of the year, we're gonna sit them down and say, look, $18 an hour, this is your starting wage, you could possibly get up to here, 
based on the chart and go on from there. But say we work about this many hours and kind of up front in the interview or in the early stages, say we work, let's say, 1,200 to 1,300 hours and this much overtime, you're going to get approximately this much. This is your salary. Let's say it's $40,000. But then in Quebec, where we are, there is unemployment where you can get like 60% of your salary in the off season. So we kind of do a little rough math and say if you apply for unemployment, you get this much. So working with us, you get your salary plus unemployment plus whatever side job you do in the winter, you have a salary approximate this. Now this could vary, but you kind of give them a path. So they look at it like a salary versus an hourly amount. And because if not, they're going to think, I make $18 here, but I'll make $18.25 here. Why don't I go to there? So you paint the picture of like, how much are you going to earn this year? Here's what we recommend. This is what most of our employees do. And you, like you said, and I, I pointed at you, you show them the path. Like from yeah. this time to this time you're working, you'll earn this much. We recommend this unemployment program for the off season. It's a seasonal industry. Now, it really depends on where you are and where you work. Here we're in Pennsylvania. I, I'm not familiar with exactly how unemployment works here, but uh, where we're from, there's a seasonal component, so you can get that. And then, like you said, if there's odd jobs and whatever on the, on the side, well, that fills in that little bit there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I feel like any situation like that it's exactly like bidding a job by the square foot. It's why you don't bid by the square foot and you present the total value of the project. A position, a paid position, you should look at it, what is the overall package, what's the value of that package? And if there are bonuses, that's part of that value. If there's paid time off, that's part of that value. If there's uh, insurance coverage or, or things like that, well, that's part of that package that makes it an overall value. So it's more difficult to jump ship for 25 cents an hour because you really have to compare apples to apples and not just you know the stem of the apple to the stem of the other apple. Yeah, we also bring in things like um, group health benefits that we're bringing in this year. There's a bonus structure attached to every employee. Um, there's other benefits, you know, this paid sick days off, all part of their, of their hiring package. We have government grants in Canada that um, people can get like a Red Seal apprenticeship program with landscaping. Mm -hmm. I just got a text message just a few minutes ago before starting for one of my employees and he, and he got the money today. He oh, got a thousand bucks in his account and he's like, there's never, he's done landscaping for, uh, you know, for us, but other companies, yeah. other trades. He's like, I never got a but grant. you have yeah. shown them the path. And he texted me today. He's like, I've never had a boss try to like get me a grant. And yeah. to me, like, I know that guy's going to be, he is a rock star already, but he's not going anywhere. Yeah. He knows that he's going to get something with us. And I say us, because I believe we're a team. It's not just me as the owner. We have a great office team, great support team uh, as well. All my project managers, I consider them the leadership team. And we are in this together and we can make this a better experience for everyone. I think that's how we're going to, identify yourself as being attractive hires. Now, if someone's gonna make 100K being a labor in landscaping a year, probably not. But if you can identify the path, and so right off the bat say, you're, you're gonna make about this much, are you willing to kind of come on board and work with this, and hopefully work your way up? And then you at least get the buy-in. People aren't shocked whenever they see it's not exactly what they expected, because you kind of just told them all by yeah. the beginning. And if it's That's in their right, contract right. too, employee agreements are super important for that as well. Cool. Yeah. Hold on, let me get closer again. Go ahead. Two part question, okay. Ooh, that's a good one. How do you hold people accountable for their actions? That's part one. And how do you align expectations between them and you as the owner? So, first part. How do you hold people accountable for their actions? Do we answer that? You go for that? I'll, I'll go You're for, the okay. guest. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a really good book called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willick. Mm -hmm. um, I, we, we believe that very firmly in our company, that, that we take ownership for things. And that's, that's the key thing to any leader is they have to be uh, accountable for their mistakes. But in being accountable, if someone comes to me with a problem, I always want them to come with a solution. So I'll be less upset for someone who made a mistake, but came and offered like a constructive solution or offered me a solution that will, you know, at least give me a partial restitution if something's broken versus someone that'll just like not have any ownership. If you have no, I'd be more concerned about someone not taking ownership um, in a company that I would be of like a clumsy mistake per se, if that makes sense. And I think you can kind of get that early on. 
um, in the hiring process or the training process, someone is not willing to admit it up to their mistakes. But it also comes down to your, to your employee agreements. If you have a, a, a rock solid employee agreement that people are accountable for their mistakes, and in the training it's a, it's a part of that, I think you'll have a lot easier time to actually influence that if you have a, if there's a known, if it's known that there's accountability for mistakes. And so whether for me, if it's someone stealing a Gatorade, an extra Gatorade, it's one a day, it's not two. If you take two, there's a consequence. And but what, what are, like, I'm, I'm gonna try to help you Go get ahead. the best answer possible. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. What does that accountability actually look like? Because it's all fine and dandy to say like, well, you know, if we have these agreements in place and these expectations and this is, like, what do you do? That guy takes that extra Gatorade, what happens? So we have a, a it's in their contract, there is a, a tier. First is verbal warning. Okay. Verbal warning is number one. So there's a structure to this yeah, too. Yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be, a, it'll be, a, it's, it's a contract, it's in, the, it's in, it's clearly outlined, there's a verbal warning. So you're gonna get, an, I'm gonna tell you, John, this is a verbal warning. You mm -hmm. stole an extra Gatorade, this is unacceptable, it's not part of our, of our core value of integrity. Once again, tying it back to the core values, is not part of our core value of integrity. You know, we expect more of you, do not do that again. I probably would be a private, and I wouldn't say You're that. You're not going to do that in public. No, we'll, we'll just you know, line that up, and, yeah. and if there's no problem, if he says sorry, which he probably would, you go from there. If it happens again, and theft, I think, is, is more serious, but let's say he does something, he like, disobeys Like being late, that's more frequent okay, than Okay, being late then. So first of all, it's a, written, a verbal warning. Second is written warning. Uh -huh. So they'll have a written warning saying this is unacceptable. Third time, there'll be, uh, there'll be a little bigger consequence. Third time, you'll be, actually have a second written warning with a day off work. Okay. No pay. Unpaid so if it, you, 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 it's not, and then again, if it, if it's a, it happens again, there's grounds for dismissal or a longer, it depends on the situation, but um, we're pretty, and then once, the guys, they know right away, if, if one guy starts off at the beginning of the season, there's always a one guy that tries He's it. He's testing. He tests yeah. it, and you almost have to like, you know, teach the lessons to the whole team, and you, just, you show it very clearly, this is not part of our core values, and, and the other guys know, well, where's Johnny? We say, well, he got a verbal warning and he got sent home, or whichever level he's at. Yeah. People understand, okay, like, they mean business here, and, and they can't, they're not putting up with this type of stuff. Yeah. But I think and it's, I feel it's that being that, accountable yeah. to that list. If, if you start showing preferential treatment because you like an employer versus another one, that's hard, and yeah. people can see that right away. And I think that part of it is, you know, and I feel like that's where this question is coming from, is a lot of business owners will feel hostage to the employees because there is a labor challenge right now. So you're like, well, I really need this person. If I tell him to go home and he doesn't come back, well, I got double the work to do for the rest of this project and I can't afford to because we got to get on the next one. And if I don't get paid for this one, well, then I can't pay for the bill of that one. And you, you just, you feel host you, you literally are hostage. So yes. how do you break that cycle? So it's hiring the right. It's hiring the right people, and hopefully you would have eliminated some of those bad eggs in the hiring process. Yeah. But some people, you know, develop and some people interview really well. Absolutely. And so let's say after a few weeks, Johnny isn't really cutting it out as well. You can have a conversation. Say, hey man, like, do you need an extra day off or something to like take care of that personal issue you have? Is there anything going I can help you with? We have two paid sick days in the year, like, or sorry, two paid. They're called sick days, but they're called personal days. Like, do you need to take an extra personal day? Like, you're you're fully paid. Like, just take that extra day. Just give me a heads up. Uh -huh. And Last year, I think only twice it happened that, that I had guys actually like not call and not show up. And there was you know, consequences for that, especially if they're more in a leadership role. But I think that having that, oh, being the type of boss that they know they can call, like, hey boss, like one guy called me, he said, hey, like I, I partied too hard last night and, I, and I, I'm hung over this morning, I can't come in. Because they know that if they come in hung over and, or, or under the influence of alcohol, that's instant dismissal, or if they're under drugs. That, that's instant dismissal, so they knew that it was less, it was a... So you have like every scenario mapped out. Well, that's why there's so. 19 pages of the... Of the <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, yeah. I, I talked to my office manager, and we say, we keep adding pages, like a, a paragraph a week, as things come up, you're like, all right, I think we covered everything yeah. here, yeah. but then something else comes up. And you have to, you have to but evolve. there's a tremendous amount of discipline that you need to show to to write down every one of these different things to be like covering your, your, your butt on everything. You every have to, and it's, yeah. it's part of our employment agreements, our contracts as well. There's all these terms and conditions come up, we have to keep adding to it. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily that we wanna screw the customer over, but we, still, we wanna at least give them before we send a contract that there be no misunderstanding. Okay. And by I, doing that, I think like having a clear picture for the employee of what's expected of them, but where they can go, that's what we hope 
to be able to build a successful career for these employees for many years to come. Sure. And then the second part of the question was setting clear expectations. I think that comes down to that 19-page agreement as well in the interview process. But really saying, like, they, these are the rules. This is what we do. Yeah, and I'll send it to them by email, like the whole contract and our handbook as well. I want them to read and understand it. And if they have any questions, uh, mm -hmm. we'll go over that. You know, in the first the first day we work, uh, whenever we're we're opening shop in the first in the spring, we go over the employee handbook. I bring a presentation slide or like a laptop, and they have a copy on their phones, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we go through every item, and just go through it very quickly. If there's any questions, we go through it. But we want them when they sign that document to have read it, understood, not just when you were you yeah. try to sign up for something and just scroll down. Yeah, exactly. And just hit, is, I agree. Right? This is an iTunes update agreement. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, I guess we, we'll, we'll take one more question. If anyone's got one, yeah. You let things slip a bit. Exactly. Yeah. How okay. So how do you implement new systems, processes, changes with an existing team? And the second part of the question, everyone's getting greedy with their questions with the two parts here. The second part of the question well, is how do you season. overcome those bad habits that kind of creep in because you're so busy that you're, you're not nipping things in the bud and they, they kind of grow and they fester. So let's say, like for example, let's say the guys in the morning are just like, around the truck, not really leaving for the job site, and I could come in there and just kind of get mad at them and say, guys, get out of here, which has happened, it's not always a good thing. But I'll use the team huddle the next day, or the day after, and say, hey guys, just remind ourselves, you know, um, we have a commitment to the client, we told the client we'd be here at a certain time, um, you know in your job agreement, back to the job agreement, that you have to be on run time, ready to go, boots tied, by seven o'clock in the morning, um, let's just make sure that doesn't happen again. And then I'll, I'll talk to the project managers, which is the direct supervisor, mm -hmm. and say, you guys are responsible Help for your Help me teams. reinforce this. You guys are the reinforcers. Um, and then have them do it. Now, I, I, I'm with you on this. It's hard to bring in change. We don't like change. No one likes, especially in the middle of the season, I would say you have to make sure that if you're bringing in something, if you have any project managers or crew leads, make sure they have the buy-in too. Because as soon as you announce something and they go off in the truck, what are they talking about? They're like, is he really serious about that whole, like, you know, you're, you're being penalized if you're late or this or that, and they'll kind of, they'll know where, yeah. they'll, they'll try to know where you stand. But if the project managers are on board and are clear on it, and there's rewards attached for the project manager based on the implementation of those plans, or if it's part of their agreement, then they have more buy-in. But the good thing with landscaping is every year, I mean, up in Canada, we start in the spring again. So you can kind of, there's a whole list of things that we're bringing in this year that we didn't do last year that, all right, we'll just implement them this year and that we're gonna hopefully have more buy-in. Some things, I've tried some things that just didn't work out and I have to say, hey guys, like this isn't working out or it's a good idea on, on paper, but it might not work for you. But consistency and showing the guys that you're consistent, I think is the strongest, um, the strongest aspect of, uh, is, is, as, as a leader is you have to show that you mean business, it's for their good, you're willing to discuss with them, but you're, you want obviously to be based on respect and make sure that it's just for the better of the company. Nice. I don't like calling people out when they're late, yeah. but I have to do it. If not, we'll have immunity in our hands. Yeah, that's a great answer. Is that good for you? Yeah? All right. Mr. Leger, thank you very much for joining us on the show. This has been super informative. I have like almost three pages of notes here. Uh, we got some great questions from the audience, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to you, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Until next time, everyone, work hard, pave harder, and we'll see you next time on the uh, Hardscape Growth Show. That's right. Thanks. Thank you.